Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Brian Keane, best-selling author of the book, The Fitness Mindset and Rewire Your Mindset, here to help you by deconstructing expert guests on all things health, fitness, and mindset. Today's guest is Alicia Kakine, aka Make Me Sugar Free on Instagram. This is a podcast I've been looking to do for ages. I've been following Alicia's Instagram page forever now. She puts up incredible content about how to remove sugar from your diet, how to work through things like sugar addiction, sugar withdrawals, and loads and loads of recipes on how to do that. And in today's podcast, we break down everything that you need to know about sugar, about sugar cleanses, sugar detoxing, beating the addiction, and making yourself sugar free. And one of the things I love so much about Leisha's content is she's not dogmatic on her approach. It's very much a removing sugar temporarily either through her seven day cleanse which is in her new book or her 21 day program or just experimenting yourself is all about improving your relationship with sugar and kind of getting off that roller coaster of feeling like you have those cravings so that you can improve your relationship with food one of the reasons I connect so much with her message and her new book which is available for pre-order now the seven day sugar cleanse beat your addiction with tasty easy to make recipes that nourish and help you resist cravings is available now as I said for pre-order so I'll link that in the description that is one that I'm going to be getting my hands on and we'll definitely be taking some recipes from it. Um, So without further ado, here is today's podcast with nutrition coach Leisha Kakine on sugar cleanses, beating the addiction and making yourself sugar free. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm delighted to be joined today with my guest, Leisha Kane. Leisha is a qualified integrative nutrition health coach and founder of Make Me Sugar Free. She's also the author of the new book, Seven Day Sugar Cleanse, Beat Your Addiction with tasty, easy to make recipes that nourish and help you resist cravings. Leisha gave up sugar at the start of 2016 and created her blog to help other people break the sugar addiction and help her audience on their way to a healthier and happier lifestyle. Her Instagram page and YouTube channel, Make Me Sugar Free, is packed with easy to make and t- tasty sugar free meals, as well as tips and advice on how to quit sugar for good and break the cycle of sugar addiction. I'm looking forward to catching up all things nutrition, sugar addiction, and going sugar free in today's episode. Leisha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And I think we can just leave it there. You've just as well as sold everything, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> we were saying, Leisha, just before we went on air, like, I love your page. I've been following your Instagram for ages and you've got great content on your YouTube there's less on there but really good stuff when it comes to sugar withdrawal and sugar cleanses and you know beating the addiction with sugar so I'm really looking forward to diving into all that today but before we do that talk a little bit about your a bit about your backstory and kind of what led you down the path of make me sugar free well first of all thank you for saying that about the Instagram page um it was really born out of it was health and I'd reached a point in my life where I was in well, it basically turns out I had stage four endometriosis. And for anybody who doesn't know about endometriosis, it's definitely worth looking up because it turns out 10, sorry, one in 10 women actually have it. And it can take anywhere between three to five years to actually get an official diagnosis of it. And in that time, the condition, it can, it worsens more often than not. So the quicker you can, you can take an inter or make an intervention, the better. So I had, by the time I'd, I was actually seeking help for it and received help help for it. I was at stage four, which is pretty much the worst that it can be. It spread from outside the uterus and the womb to the bowel and the bladder. And I was mo- and it was beyond that as well. And so I was pretty much in a bad state. I was told that I was infertile and just a whole myriad of just the worst kind of health news you could get at that stage when you want to start a family. So I went on a hunt to find somebody who could help. I discovered a really amazing guy called Dr. Chris Mann and I went to see him and after he'd examined me, he'd said that pretty much the the most he could do for me was to offer me a hysterectomy. You know, I was 39 years old then and I thought, for me, it felt like last chance saloon to have a family. And it just felt so final that it just... It put me. It was the catalyst, really, for me to look for other ways to uh, to try and 
I suppose, to find some kind of solution for endometriosis. And lots of studying later, lots of research, I discovered that sugar is a huge inflammatory cause, basically, within the body that it can lead to all sorts of poor health. There are now links in certain studies showing that endometriosis has direct links to, to like poor gut health. And one of the biggest offenders and causes of poor gut health is sugar because it disrupts a lot of the gut microbiome. So all of these things I kept stumbling across in different studies that I'd read and all the research was collating. It kept pointing, well, certainly me, it kept pointing me down the root of sugar being the root of all my health evil anyway. So I decided against the hysterectomy and against uh, my gynecologist, um, his advice. But I just almost felt at this stage, everything I'd read, everything I'd done, that it felt almost like intuitive for me to take this route. So we left it three months. He said, OK, I'll do the first op and then I'll book you in three months later for the second operation for the hysterectomy. I was like, right, fine. And uh, Long story short, within that three months, I completely just lived um, everything that I'd read and, and everything I'd started to espouse and preach. And yes, yeah, so I came off of sugar, just really cleaned my health. And I, by the way, I thought I always was healthy before this, but I was eating healthy. I was doing exercise, but I was still like, I'd, you know, I'd have a long day and I just like shovel, you know, a quick bar of chocolate or, you know, biscuits or canned, you know, soda drinks, whatever. So I was actually negating a lot of the healthy things that I was doing and was, um, you know, turning a blind eye to eating all of the, the sugary junk. Anyway, three months passed after the first operation into the second and he had noticed a significant improvement. And I just knew, and I said, I'm absolutely not going to have the hysterectomy. Do what you can do with ablation, but I'm not going to have the hysterectomy. And I didn't. And that's six years on. And I, thank God, haven't had any remission of endometriosis. And I feel energetically and uh, so much better and just general health like I lived on codeine I'd say three weeks of every month I would just be an almost like a, co a codeine coma it used to feel like because I was in so much pain it's the only thing that would kind of work and that's completely gone I don't have to take any painkiller now and thankfully it seems like it's fully in remission so that's the story <laughs> in a nutshell it's incredible. And I have a lot of different things I want to unpack here because, as you said, sugar being the root of all evil in terms of your case. And I think there's a lot of people who are similar. And one thing that I came across, and I've heard you speak about this before, is that you saw sugar as a reward. And I just wanted to unpack that a little bit because this is definitely something that I've done as well. You know, you talk about, and, and I think your words were espousing holistic remedies and the benefits of healthy eating, and then you'd re reward yourself with a bar of chocolate or with dessert. How did you break out of that mindset or that thought process and I ask that kind of selfishly as somebody that still does that and you know one of the things I love about your content is it gives the alternative routes and recipes and again the book particularly you know I'm going to be going through those recipes myself and just seeing how much they impact me in terms of just removing sugar and not eating it as much but talk about seeing sugar as a reward and how you kind of broke that cycle initially. Right you see well here is something that it's First of all, sugar, the relationship we have with sugar is a very complicated one because, I mean, you know this yourself, you have the dopamine reward pathway and also the way in our society, it's, it's like it's almost the perfect storm for us because there are billions of dollars put into marketing of sweet, and I'd say inverted commas, treats, and uh, that it's it's pushed down to everywhere you look it's such a ubiquitous substance so you know you go into a garage and you've got wall to wall when you go to pay for your petrol or diesel you're faced with like a, a wall of confectionery you go into a diy store on your way out to check to check out again you see there's all confectionery or there's like sugary drinks there it's made so easy and and it's so ubiquitous that it's really hard to avoid. It's not like cigarettes now where they are hidden behind a wall in a supermarket or wherever you go and buy them in a news agent. It's, you know, they're, they're all, it's wrapped in gorgeous, enticing foil. And it's everything about sugar is marketed to us to make it feel like it's a reward. So we are faced with one, what's happened to us on a psychological level, that there is a, a reward loop there and we eat it, how it spikes the dopamine, et cetera. Then, of of course, there are these the billion part bill sorry billion dollar marketing budgets geared specifically around us to make make it look more enticing. Then on top of that, we as humans, so let's say we've been around for what two hundred thousand years, 
sugar really has only been this available to us so excessively in the last 100 years and predominantly the last 50 years. So on an evolution level, our bodies have not had chance to catch up the same way the food industry has has evolved so rapidly when it comes to distributing sugar and sugary snacks and treats, etc. to us. So there's, I look at it as like this unholy trinity when it comes to sugar addiction. So when you say, oh, how do you a- approach it? I think we have to break it down. Like, how do we how do we attack? How do we attack trying to extract ourselves or or or, or overcome sugar addiction? And I think you have to look at everything because the first misconception with sugar is it's our willpower. We are weak. We can't say no. Oh no, I'm terrible. I can't say no to to a packet of biscuits. Or, but it's not us. What we have to realise, and this is the really important thing, it's not your lack of willpower. There is a physiological thing that's going on here as well because we do not have a corresponding hormone that tells us we have had enough because by and large, as we said then about us being here for 200,000 years, sugar should be scarce. Naturally, sugar is scarce. You know, how often do you come across like a honeycomb? How often, you know, fruit is, is more often than not seasonal. And you look at where sugar originates, it shouldn't be so available to us. So we've never had to have this hormone that says, oh, wait, well, you've eaten more than enough there. You know, we don't crave a, a bowl of broccoli the same way that we crave a bowl of sweets or, or a plate of biscuits or a slice or two of cake, you know, and that's what it is. So straight away, we're starting off on the back foot. So the biggest thing and the most easiest thing I say, if you are really clear that you want to come off sugar and you want to reduce it or lead a low or no sugar lifestyle is eliminate it like literally eliminate it because if it's in the house you're going to eat it and the other thing is it has now become such a part of our social life like everything socially is geared around some kind of sugar so birthdays it's birthday cakes weddings it's wedding cakes you know even now a lot of adverts it's oh say thank you to somebody with a box of chocolates or oh let's sit down and have a friday night you know even with the girls and let's open up a big bag of of you know some chocolate treats or whatever so that's the other thing as well it's it's looking at your social activity how you can start to change things and your approach is really important so know what the triggers are like whenever i have clients who come to me or they want to do the 21 day program that i also do the same things always come up that they are frightened of say their coffee morning with the girls or their their um baby dates because often coffee will come with a cake or something sweet or they'll meet in a cafe and they get very frightened that if they eliminate sugar it's going to change how they lead their life. And that, again, is another myth and a misconception because what happens is you start to be a little bit more present. You you change how you know you you change what is instead of just being sitting down and relying on what you're eating. You're engaged in other ways because you deliberately find other social engagements. Now, this isn't forever. This is in the initial stages of you trying to wean yourself off of sugar. Now, I don't know whether I've answered that question, Brian, because I think I've answered about five in my head for you then. But essentially, it's about observing what triggers your craving, removing those um, those triggers in the first instance. And especially the biggest one is to eliminate sugar from your household because when a craving hits, often wild horses couldn't stop you. So if it's not there, you can't eat it. And that's the top and bottom of it. It's a really, it's a really, really addictive substance. Some people will argue it's not. But I feel that addiction is classified as something that causes a change in behavior. And anybody who struggles with with sugar, as I did, if I opened a bag, of, a big multi bag of sweets, they would all be gone. I could not stop at one. Whereas if that was any other food sub- substance, I would be able to have that self-control. So, yes, sugar changes certainly my behavior. So therefore, I think it should definitely be considered and classified as an addictive substance. Brilliant. You've given me so much to unpack there, Leisha, in a lot of different directions that I want to cover. But I think just to pull back for people, what you said is about, you know, the evolutionary reason we've been around for, you know, 10,000 plus years, 200,000 plus years, and our body hasn't designed a hormone to say you're good for sugar. Like that is, you know, something I'll regularly say to people is your body's a basic survival mechanism. Like it's designed to keep you alive. It's not, doesn't care if you're fat it doesn't care if you're gaining weight it doesn't care if you want to build muscle its primary job is to keep you alive and something that kept you alive thousands of years ago was that craving for sugar that scarcity of high caloric foods like you know honey that you could eat a lot of it and that might be the thing that got you to your next meal you know 10,000 years ago but now you know it's something where we're in this disease of abundance versus a disease of scarcity for the probably the first time in you know modern society when you talk about the last five, 50 to 100 
years. So I think that's really important to understand and that there's nothing necessarily wrong with you if you have addiction to sugar. There's a physiological response to that. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, you're going to have some withdrawals. You're going to have a problem with the addiction to it, but that's not all within your control. I know something you talk about, Leisha, which we'll unpack is about using that willpower initially and then until your body kind of overcomes it. But before we dive into that, you mentioned there about triggers, you know, the coffee date with the girls, etc. What are some of the other triggers that people have? Is it mostly based around events or meetings with other people? Is it triggers through, you know, an evening routine? Or what are some of the common triggers that you find? Because we can unpack and use potentially some step-by-step guidelines that people might be able to to implement that will help them work through it. But what are some of the common triggers that you see? Right. So the common triggers for me, right, you'd have that I've come across mostly is the evening meal. So whenever anybody sits down after an evening meal, they'll go, oh, I want something sweet. So that's the first one. The second one is um, much more for the female, well, obviously for the female audience, is around period time. So look at your cycle, whether it be ovulation or whether it be when you're just during a period or on it. And that's because you start to get your hormones are dipping, they're moving. So you're, you notch, whenever you're on your period, your mineral absorption isn't quite as pronounced or as effective sorry you don't assimilate your minerals as well so your body again is looking for additional kind of support or energy so it's those times so then and also tiredness tiredness is one of the biggest things now we hear people go oh it's because i crave chocolate because i'm lacking in magnesium well you are actually that is true and the, so i'd say that they're probably the the main times oh sorry the other time as well is the so i'd say the afternoon just after you've eaten your lunch people will be at their desk and they are flagging come 2 p.m. It's always a time that people go, oh, I can literally fall asleep. And that's often because they've had, they've got, they've had the breakfast, then got their 11s in, so they'll have a cup of tea or a coffee with something else, like a, a biscuit Dunkin' or something else sweet. Then it comes to their lunch. And then by that stage, they have been on that sugar um, cycle roller coaster and the blood sugar roller coaster. So when you said before about the brain and how all the brain wants to do is to keep us alive, you are absolutely on the money because the brain will always collude with us. If we're feeling tired, it's like, oh my God, okay, we need we need more glucose. But you've got a whole physiological thing that's been going on. You eat too much sugar, you're, you know, you're it's like you start on this roller coaster because then the pancreas starts to release too much insulin and that goes into that's basically into the, to remove the um, the sugar from the bloodstream, but then it might remove too much. So then that your brain starts to panic and okay, we need a quick what's happened here we're flagging we need more quick energy so a quick energy your body knows is often a sugar or high sugar snack which is often sugar loaded so then you're eating that and then back onto the the sugar roller coaster you go and so what happens is i'd say that the main areas to look out for is your 11s is well start your day i'd say with something that is not sugary so you at least start with that homeostasis at that point of balance and then look at how you eat then so i'd always say opt for something with protein in the morning because at least you're giving yourself half a chance you know to get to the 11s is and then when it gets to 11s think about what you're having often caffeine can exacerbate a, a a craving whether that be for cigarette or for sugar so think about what you're having in your 11s is break as well like can you just have warm lemon water this is just to start breaking down those habits then when it gets into your lunch again think about what you have when you want slow release food so think of and the other thing as well this is not about depriving this is not about scarcity i'd say the opposite it's about cramming out but cramming out with things that are going to boost your mineral intake that are going to give you the energy that's going to be a slow release fiber that just keeps that energy but on a nice even keel to try and have like a high protein uh, with plenty of fiber for your lunch and then when it gets into the evening this sounds so simple but i cannot tell you as a technique that helps you so much after you've eaten move immediately so it's our tendency to go oh my god i'm eating i'm so full or and you just sit then you talk and then straight away it's too easy to be like oh should we have something sweet if you get up, you pack away your dishes, you need to distract yourself. Like you're breaking so many habits that have been so formed and, and we are so habitual as people. So the psychology of us and our habits, you need to create the new the new pathway, the new neuron pathway, the new habit. So don't just sit there, get up and move, put the dishes away. And if that's not working as well, go and brush your teeth because the other thing, and this is the most simple, simple hack, it's often those lingering tastes of the savoury that then we then start to um, can trigger, especially salt, can trigger sugar cravings and vice versa. 
Melissa, sugar can crave uh, can trigger the salt cravings too. So you need to just clean your palate. So that's one of the best things, either a nice um, herbal tea, like a licorice, but be careful having too much licorice tea if you have high blood pressure. But there are other ones like a peppermint tea or even like a lemon water, something that's really pungent in taste that triggers, and also something quite bitter and astringent because that activates the enzymes, so the digestive enzymes. So you're less likely to start craving sugar. But I would say get up straight away after your dinner and move, put the dishes away, clean up. You need that break. You need to break that association from dinner time with, oh, yeah, now I'll have dessert. So they're like the little obvious hacks. The other thing then when it comes to female cycles, start observing how you are when you feel the most tired. And I do recommend, I'm not one really who recommends a lot of supplements, but I do think sometimes women do need supplements, and especially if you suffer with endometriosis because you don't absorb your minerals so well. So straight away, I'll just say magnesium. For me, magnesium is the king of minerals. And I take a really lovely supplement called Mag365. And I only take that because it's a powder form. I add that to warm water to activate it, have that. And it, and I know it just keeps my energy. And I've just, it, but it really, do, for me, it's worked. And the other thing with it as well, it really helps with anybody struggling with anxiety. And funny enough, when you start to, sugar can cause anxiety, but also during a withdrawal stage, you can be prone to anxiety as well because there's a, there's a panic in your body. You've always had this energy. So things like magnesium at that stage is also really important. And another really helpful supplement to take is chromium. That really helps subside a lot of sugar cravings as well. Brilliant. The Mag365 is one of my staples as well for a whole host of reasons, you know, relaxing the central nervous system, helping with sleep, but definitely for sugar cravings. And interesting, you said there something bitter. When I, I go through phases when I'm training for races where I'll massively reduce my carbohydrate and sugar intake and I go with apple cider vinegar after meals and that just breaks my craving instantly. Like it's very similar to what you said about the lemon water or the herbal teas. But you mentioned there withdrawal. Alicia, talk to us about sugar withdrawal because I've had conversations with people and this is your area of expertise because I know your 21 day program talks through this your book talks through this but I've had people that I've worked with in my program who would go from quite a high sugar diet onto my plan which is you know 80% whole foods now I don't eliminate chocolate from my programs I don't eliminate favorite foods I, I try and incorporate them in because it's mostly weight loss mostly fat loss body composition that I work with so it's a case of you know finding what works best for you based on what your individual goal is but something that happens to a lot of people particularly those who would have a highly pro processed food diet with a lot of sugar when they switch to say 80% whole foods they get some withdrawals off the bat and it's normally from that lack of sugar it's that withdrawal with sugar talk to us about sugar withdrawals yeah you're absolutely right and interestingly when okay so sugar withdrawal so if we start back, you were just saying then about how you will crave, say, apple cider vinegar. It's actually a really beautiful Irish brand that I use. And I've forgotten the name, Vita. Oh, my God, I've just forgotten the name. Um, but, but they do a lovely uh, vinegar and it's full of so many botanicals. It's it's It cuts through the same way that the apple cider vinegar does. But I love that it has all the other botanicals. So you're getting much more as well packed in. So you get like more of the, the tonifying, astringent kind of taste uh, flavor profiles as well, because that's really important. The reason why it's so important, every, all of our food now you'll notice, so let's just take low fat that's on the market, for example. Low fat will be that it's often laced with sugar and laced with excess salt. So what happens, like I said before, one will trigger the other and vice versa. So you have so many other flavor profiles, but what people don't realize is when you eat something bitter, that is activating your enzymes. So the minute it kind of goes onto your tongue, it's like, oh, okay, incoming food, I'm waiting for that. So already it's sending the messages to your body to, it's preparing your body for incoming food. So that's not just to digest, that's to assimilate uh, or everything the, the, to take the nourishment from the food as well. So going back to the, uh, and the reason why that's important when you enter into a detox is because you've probably deprived yourself unwittingly, not you, but one has deprived themselves of all those flavor profiles. And with that, there's all the benefits of the food. So on the on my program, what I do is I warn, I'll come to what the what you might expect from withdrawals, but also it's really important that you equip yourself for them. So the obvious withdrawals that probably my clients have, have experienced and I have as well is the energy dip initially. You're just like, oh my God, because suddenly your body is looking for another way to find its energy source. But what happens then, this is what I'm saying about eating, say, for example, the more bitter foods, 
and when you were releasing the enzymes and you're digesting food properly and you're assimilating all of the nutrients and the vitamin profiles, etc., what happens there is you probably for the first time are having more minerals than you ever have done, you know, for, for years and years. Because when we eat high sugar, what happens, we've sorry, got a high sugar diet. What tends to happen is it blocks a lot of the nutrients because, again, the body's all, you said before, the body's all about just, uh, the brain's all about just making life as easy as possible for us. So it's always going to find the quickest route. And oftentimes it goes, oh, sugar, okay, we can convert that really quickly so we don't need to worry about this other thing, this this head of broccoli or collie or whatever else we're, we're absorbing. We can just use that. So what happens is while in the, in the interim when you come off sugar, it's about, and your body's like, it's almost like, well, you know this yourself, you're switching over to another energy source. It's really important that then you're eating the right things. And that just bypasses that struggle very, very quickly. And you want to get into feeling like, actually, my body is really firing all cylinders now, far better than it was before for eating a, a donut and a muffin for breakfast and whatever sugary snacks afterwards. So the first thing is, is what I would say to cram out. So that helps with that, that dip in energy that you'll experience for the first day or two. The other thing that you can really expect is headaches and not everyone gets this. But again, I think we discovered is a lot of hormonal change and also it's like a die off. You know, don't forget you've gotten your let's look at gut health. So your gut microbiome is if you've been eating loads of sugar, chances are you might have candida. But if you don't have candida, you're certainly going to have an overgrowth of bad bad gut bacteria so don't you've got like a die off of that as well that's there's, there's so many changes actually occur in the body the minute you change your diet for good or for bad so the headache i just say for that the best thing you can do is to ride it out but really hydrate yourself help the body to move a lot of the the build up of like any sugar or any of the toxic overload really of from eating sugar and move that through the body move that through the digestion tract sweat move sweat as much of that out as possible you know what you want is just to I always think to to kind of get the body moving and then when it's move whatever it is in your body, move that out. So that's plenty of water, plenty of, uh, and then plenty of movement as well. Sweat, sweat it out. So that's always good for, I always think for headaches. The other thing that you can really expect as well is, as I mentioned before, is anxiety. And that's, like, I'm not sure why we get anxiety when we give up sugar, because it's one of the things actually a week into being sh- I can actually speak to this. I, I had, I'm um, sorry to cut come. across here, but just, Please. yeah, I, I can, I can speak to this. I had Dr. Tim Spector on the podcast who is an expert in gut health. This is his area of research. And he spoke on the podcast about the link between, you know, the serotonin in the gut and the die off of, you know, with poor, poor gut bacteria. Again, I'm paraphrasing now. This is his area. I'll, I'll link that podcast for people. But he spoke about that, what you mentioned there, Alicia, that when you have all that bad bacteria in your gut and, you know, I think it's 80 to 95% of your serotonin, your happy hormones pr- pr- produced in your gut. So once you're removing the amount of sugar, you're getting this uh, dip in mood and you're getting the anxiety that comes alongside it. It's a little bit of a, a kind of a, 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 a catch 22 in the sense that your energy level is low so you don't feel as good but also your gut health isn't optimized so you feel poor and you feel more anxious and stressed and your ability to withstand normal day-to-day things isn't as high while your body's detoxifying itself so yes i just wanted to add to that because he spoke on this kind of at detail just because this is his area so it's a it's a nice lad on to what you said there well it sounds really really interesting you know but here's the thing so that's again it's the hormonal impact ultimately but like that here's where it gets really interesting and a weekend and this is how incredible our bodies are that um say a week onto the program people are like oh my god I, that's it I, I've, I've given up sugar i feel absolutely amazing but we always say we say the 21 days originally initially because it really by that stage 21 days you have really formed those habits so that's why we're like you know Make sure you stick with it. But it's exactly that. You are starting to change your gut microbiome. And that is so important. You know, and you're you're propagating it basically. You're recolonizing it with good but good gut bacteria. So good by eating, like you said before, you've got 80% whole foods on, on your program. It's eating food that that sustain us, you know, properly, that give it that nourish us. But um the other thing, so there, so the obvious things really when you give up sugar, there's headache. You know, more than that as well, 
with the anxiety, the anxiety is probably caused by hormones, but also it's there's a lot of fear, societal fear. Whenever you embark on a diet, there's an, an element of, of excitement, but then there's always, always an element of, oh my God, what happens if I can't do it? There's always fear of failure or so there's also like a psycho like a psychological impact as well that I think can create a little bit of anxiety too. Whenever we embark on I say diet, this is not a diet, you know, it's it's a lifestyle change. But the other thing is I always think it's one thing to focus on than on how you might feel. But the other really important thing when you come off of sugar is to focus on within two days of you not, that's 48 hours of you not eating sugar, you will sleep. Going to bed on the third night, you will sleep so well because you're not on that blood sugar roller coaster. That's gone. You're suddenly like in a nice balance, a nice homeostasis. And the other thing is as well, your energy, your moods, you, they naturally start to stabilize. You know, it's return us to more of what we should be. And the other thing, after three days, you will notice a brightening in your skin. You notice an improvement with your elasticity. The other thing as well with sugar is that if, 30 minutes after eating sugar, your immune system halves. It impacts how our immune system functions and, and responds. And that lasts for up to five hours after you've taken sugar. So within 30 minutes of eating sugar, your immune system is halved. And then that lasts, that reduction lasts for up to five hours after consuming sugar. So you imagine then when you eliminate sugar, just how good that vitality that you start to feel and that you allow your body and all of its functions just to really kick in. So even that alone, like we when we eat a certain way, we forget what that true vitality, what that life force actually feels like. So rather than me going like I do really preface this with anybody who goes on the program and also in the book, I say, you know, you are going to feel like this, but it doesn't last. And as quickly as they come up for you, they subside and it make and it makes way for just for overall health, like, you know, improved energy, improved skin, less brain fog, uh, stabilizing in your mood, so you get less mood swings. And also as well, the bigger things. So they're like the initial things that you can see from day one to day four and five, you know. But then longer term, you're looking at uh, reductions in cancer and cancers, reductions in risk of type 2 diabetes, reduction in uh, risk of stroke and coronary heart disease. So these are things that we never look at, you know. So it's I think whenever you embark on a uh, any type of detox or cleanse or you want to kind of go on more of a healthier path, I think it's really good to have the, the day one, day two, day three, week one, week two, week three, and then monthly and then longer term goals. So you can really assess how you feel. And I think that that is what's really important to keep you on the right path as well. When you can keep on feeling and seeing improvements, you know, it works for you. And by the way, I need to caveat this as well. This is when I say to do like the uh, the 21 day program, a seven day book cleanse, no, sorry, sugar cleanse. It's not about never eating sugar again. What it is, it's about giving you trust again in your eating habits and giving you that power back And in terms of your how you eat so you're not falling prey to cravings. So you go, all right, you know what? I fancy a little bit of sugar. I'll have a little bit and that's it and I'll stop. And then the other thing is as well, it's just, it's giving you power over your eating habits and your cravings. And that's really important. So what I see the 21 day plan as being and certainly with the seven day sugar cleanse being, it's a disruption. It's an opportunity just to create that and cultivate new healthy habits. And I think that's really important before we embark on anything or else I feel it might feel a little bit too insurmountable for people. So it is really important to remember that these things are just incremental changes and it's all step by step. Yeah, and I can speak to that as someone who follows your content. And one of the things I loved so much about it, Alicia, is that you're not dogmatic in your approach. It's very much a case of I'm going to empower you with your nutrition so that you can get off this roller coaster and have what I think. And again, this is just my interpretation of your content, that you can have a better relationship with food and a better relationship with sugar, as opposed to removing it, never eating it again. The root of all evil is in sugar. You know, obviously, we've talked on a lot of the negative issues that can come alongside it. But I think your content and, you know, the book as well, is very much down to you know improving your relationship with it educating yourself on it getting off that roller coaster or addiction to sugar and then just having more control and I think that's why it's so helpful for people I just wanted to add one other thing that you said there too about you know all the benefits of reducing your sugar one of the reasons that I 
personally remove it in the lead up to races is down to the inflammatory response like when my training weeks go up for an ultra marathon or for a triathlon like my body if I'm taking sugar like my knees ache and my elbows ache and all these body parts that once I remove the sugar it goes away it's largely down to an inflammatory response for the most part and I think for people A lot of people listening to this podcast won't be at the upper end of that level of training. But I think even if you're getting older, you know, I'm in my 30s now, you know, people in their 40s, people in their 50s listening to this podcast, just the removal of sugar alone can make you feel less sore throughout the day. And again, I speak to that as somebody that does these endurance events and one of the reasons that I remove it. So I just wanted to add that as well, because I think it's really, really helpful for people. When it comes to sugar detox, then Alicia, What's something that you know now that you wish you had known before you started your journey first in, you know, early 2016, you know, and I asked that as somebody that comes in and out of eating sugar myself and a lot of people listening to this podcast will jump straight on and off the back of this. And again, I definitely recommend experimenting with going sugar free, you know, follow the protocol in the in the book, you know, seven day sugar cleanse or the 21 day program to extend that even longer. But what's something that you wish you had known when you started first that would have made life easier for you for those that are currently considering doing that now? Uh, right. So there's about, there's probably about three things there is three things that jump to mind on that because wish i'd known right first of all it's really important to say that you say how you jump in and out of it that's good there is no hard and fast rule to this even if we have two week reprieve we just eat really healthy that's two weeks of sheer goodness in our body so that's just good that's good you know and and it's all personal choice so i always think when i gave up smoking Oh my gosh, I must have tried giving up smoking about 10 times before I did. And now I've not smoked for over 10 years. And and I remember each time I was like, oh, when I'd start smoking, I'd be like, oh, I'm the biggest failure. But actually, I never was. And it was just each time I tried, even if it was for two days I didn't smoke or it was for two months, each time I broke that, that was me telling one part of my subconscious, you are capable of this and you can. Whether So always hold on to that. If this is something that you can go back and revisit and revisit again, because if it if it was so easy, n- none of us would be, like the amount of people who come through um, and do my 21 day program, or it's just everybody who I speak to has got, oh, I wish I didn't have to eat sugar. I'm just so obsessed with it. Oh, I really crave it. It's it is an addictive substance. So I think the first thing is it, it doesn't matter if you fall off the wagon. Just get back on again in your own time, and that's it. And it's each time you try, you are disassociating yourself more and more from it, which I think is really important. I just think as a message to yourself, it it helps you in those times in the initial stage of the willpower, and you need to not have it in the house. I think it'll really help. The other thing is to remember this really probably sticks with me the most because when I say I gave up trying to get smoking 10 times at least I can tell you that sugar was the hardest thing honestly ever that I think I felt like I was a blue bottle wherever there was a, I could even hear somebody in the other room open a pack of smoke. Oh, what are you that? what's that almost like you know and so I really know and I really feel this in people because I tried so many times and I feel like oh this is so miserable this is no way to live hence the make me sugar free page which I wanted people to go no you can still eat really healthily you have all what you want but there's a healthier way of doing it but the other thing is and this really really motivates me because I realized that I when you look at everything how it makes you feel when you come off the wagon I'd feel so disappointed and just like so sick of myself and you know you know it's bad and yeah I've eaten it now I've made a you know pig of myself and but I don't feel really bad and then it really the more I started to research like the more marketing side of it and the PR and that psychology of what the ad agencies use It made me realize really quickly that this isn't my lack of willpower. Every turn, every billboard, every magazine, every bus stop you drive past or every, you know, every or every time you listen to the radio, you are being marketed to in some capacity. You know, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram. There are always things being marketed to you. And that is to peak your cravings, you know, to make it insatiable. And sugar is a much once more substance. You know, I don't for many people with any kind of when they crave sugar they can't just have a little bit and they're satiated no it is a much once more the more you have the more you want and that's the truth of sugar so 
in this, it's really important, again, if you're on and off the, the wagon, to remember that you are being marketed to. So have that in mind. There's somebody being paid to sit in a boardroom somewhere to come up with a genius campaign to manipulate you and to persuade you into thinking you need this. It's going to give you sociable times. It's going to help you say thank you to a neighbour. You need it to be like everybody else. And that's bullshit. That's subscribing to somebody else's paycheck at your health, you know, at the risk of your health. And I think that was the a real aha moment for me. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm not falling for this anymore. No, you know, and I need to take control of my life. I need to tune out of these, of the advertise, this barrage of advertising that, that's manipulating me to behave in a certain way. And I think when you become aware of that, you still fall prey to it, but actually it gives you that little bit more control. And I think it gives you that bit more grow to go, no, actually, I'm all right, thanks. Because you realise it's about it's a bit more sinister. You know, the sugar is packaged to us to look also delightful and tasty and sparkly and, and gorgeous. But actually, it's, I think it's a really sinister product. You know, and it's just, it's weaved into everything. It's in, it's hidden in so many foods. So remember that, that it's being marketed to you with the sole intention for you to be addicted and to, and to want to have more and more and more of it. So I think when you start to see it a little bit and you see the bigger picture, it makes you go, all right, I'm taking control. I'm sick of being controlled by by a marketing exec or an advertising executive. And I think that that's a little bit more empowering. Yeah, I put up an Instagram post a couple of years ago that, you know, uh, again, there's no hard and fast rule. But I think this is true for 99.9% of cases that, you know, if it, the food is advertised on TV, you should probably avoid it. Like when was the last oh. time, you, you know, when was the last time you saw an ad for broccoli? <laughs> like you just, yeah. you, you don't. But I think it's, it's a good protocol because you think of all the foods that get advertised on TV and again there's a massive power to marketing regardless of what it is that people are selling but you mentioned there I just wanted to cut across Alicia because I think it's really important um, because I know you've covered this on your page and you covered this on your channels but about the hidden sugar in foods what are some of the examples of that? Oh my goodness. So, right, hidden sugars, right? So just to put it into context, according to the World Health the World Health Organization guidelines for sugar, they say 25 grams for women and 35 grams for men. Now, I don't know about you, okay, maybe you because you're on it with things like this, but I would not I don't deal in metrics, you know, I really don't <laughs> and, and it's um I'm writing the book as well, like, ooh, what's this? You know, I had to measure things properly. But just to put it into context, 25 grams for women a day, that's seven teaspoons seven teaspoons right and then that's nine teaspoons for a man so when you put that into food right that basically you can have a can of soda well say most cans i don't want to call anyone out and be sued but the average can of soda is about 30 grams so for a woman you're already over after having one can of soda and you're just on you know coming up to the level for a man so then if you have like say so when it comes to say tomato sauce i always say tomato sauce ketchup because it's the most obvious Whoever has a little squirt, you know, you always have more than you realize. So sauces and condiments are probably people's biggest downfalls because you're looking at about what there's a, a teaspoon of sugar per teaspoon, if you like, thereabouts. So that's the first thing. But then it's also when people say, OK, I'm going gluten free now. And I'm like, right, OK, do you are you doing that to be healthy or do you think you have a gluten intolerance or is it celiac? And they're like, oh, I think it's healthy. It's like, well, we'll look into this first because that isn't necessarily a healthier route because you look at the ingredients and there's a lot of binders there instead of like the, the more gluten that they use. But also, they sweeten it with so much sugar. So people, again, you know, it's that marketing, it brings it back to that. Something's been marketed to them under the banner of it's healthy. It's gluten free, right? So it's healthy. But actually, it isn't. Oftentimes, they can be loaded with sugar. So that's one. And then it's, you know, I always think as well, when it comes to um, cooking, when you cook at home, because if you buy an average jar of, say, tomato sauce to add to a pasta dish, they are full of sugar. Yogurt as well marketed to women so supremely as being like the savior of, of a diet culture that I don't like at all and you know horses for courses but that's just something that I don't like but but yogurt always seem to it's almost like the, the poster product isn't it have a yogurt if you're on a diet and you're a woman but you look at the back of that and it's always low fat but actually you'll see there's a lot of hidden sugars and if not hidden sugars sweeteners now, this is the other thing. I know this isn't your question, but I always get asked about sweeteners an awful lot. And I would say the thing about sweeteners for me is that depending on what ones you use, some are healthier than others. But the thing with, with sweeteners is that you are wanting to change your palate. And instead of always craving sugar, you want to start reducing that. And that's just going to help you. And the minute you can. So instead of just if you're eating something that's laced with a load of sweetener, you're still fueling that that 
craving or that desire to have and to taste something sweet. So I would say just try not to get used to the different flavors, you know, and and that will just really help with your cravings. Like make exercise those flavors become more used to them you gave Um, me kind of the perfect segue because i was going to follow on with what your thoughts were on sweeteners but as you mentioned there and talked about earlier i know you talk about this quite a bit that obviously when you remove sugar from your diet i think people forget this sometimes is you're effectively kind of cleansing your palate or or your taste buds change you know so you end up tasting foods differently and i think that's important to understand that food doesn't become bland once you remove sugar because your taste buds will adjust and you know it happens to me all the time when I remove it I find that you know things like my vegetables and just my my normal food sweet potato is really sweet when I'm not eating any other type of sugar Um, and it just your taste buds become kind of more finely attuned I'm just going to pick up on something you said there as well Alicia because one of my biggest pet peeves in all of nutrition is low fat yogurts when it comes to weight loss journeys and you've touched on it there and just to, to unpack that for people the reason that low fat yogurts are loaded with sugar is just basic calories like a gram of sugar or a gram of carbohydrates worth four kilocalories where a gram of fat is worth nine kilocalories so if you remove that fat and you load it up with sugar you can still keep the calories quite low that doesn't make it healthier if anything it probably makes it worse in my opinion for a whole host of reasons that Lisa's talked about but don't fall for it I think it's just I wanted to unpack that because there's definitely some listening who do that and it's just one of see, my biggest you, pet you'd peeves know all personally the metrics. you see the way you just roll them off <laughs> it's like I'm really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 my bread and butter. To be fair, it's similar to that. I'm not great with the recipes and uh, and the cooking. That's uh, not my area. Although, again, you break it down very easily, and I'll be definitely experimenting with the ones from the book. And the reason, just so people know, that we haven't gone into recipes on this podcast is this is your entire Instagram page. Like anyone who's not following you, go check out your Instagram page. There is just loads of recipes up there from bread breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks that you can apply. And then obviously the book, Seven Day Sugar Cleanse, is going to have that as well. I just have one final question, Alicia, before we tell everybody where they can pick up the book, where they can join the program. And it just to, it feels like I'm going to shoehorn it in slightly here. But you did mention earlier about when someone wants to go sugar-free, that cold turkey is normally the best approach. Would you always recommend that it's a, for the lack of a better term, suck it up for three days until your body becomes accustomed and obviously give yourself the 21-day run time? similar to your program and you do it or would you at any case recommend people gradually reduce it what's your kind of thoughts on that just from your experience of working with people right so when it comes to sugar and i said before that it's a real much once more substance you really do have to cold turkey it because it's just how it works physiologically on the body uh, psychologically as well and also when it's gone you have three days the hardest part is done in those three days and i say three days i have some people after two days are like actually this is a lot easier than i ever thought but then the other i've got other people who need like the two weeks so i always find week one one week is really is really good but genuinely uh, I would say you have to cold turkey it. And there's a real self, There's that's not just for how you're eliminating it from your body, and but you have to cleanse that palate because it's like a lot of people who experience sugar addiction, when they have one thing, it's like it's opened that can of worms. It's like, oh my God. And then before they know it, they've eaten a full tub of ice cream or they've eaten a full packet of biscuits or they've eaten a, a big, you know, a big bar of chocolates. And it's, it's like they become possessed so and i know that is true of me so that's just air on the side of caution it's like just just come off of it give yourself the fighting chance like um cleanse that palate change how you taste foods and um and that is probably the most important thing i don't think you can half do it you have to you have to be all in for those three days without a doubt and actually the 21 day program is two full weeks without anything without any so much as even fruit and at, then at the end of the two weeks you have a blueberry and honestly it really is like an orgasm in the mouth it's like <laughs> what is this this otherworldly thing i'm eating it's like it is genuinely it's incredible and that shows how much we can take control and how much we can actually restore our, our palate to what it should be instead of these hyper sweetened tastes that, that we end up covered in and craving, you know? So that's why we say to eliminate it. And then the seven day book, the reason I've done the seven day cleanse is that I feel that this feels a bit more palatable for people, pardon the pun there, but it's, it is more like you still get the same, the same information. You get all the same tips. You get all like the full, all the name breakdowns of what, how the different names for 
for sugar, how are they hide, where they're hidden, or the foods that you won't necessarily think are high in sugar, but they convert to sugar in the body the same way. Like, for example, like white bread, for example, you know, and um, people don't necessarily think of being sugary as such, but they are. And that's how they convert in the body. So the seven days is a really good way to show you that this is how you can eat. You are eating everything you still want. But you are. It's again, it brings it back to that. You're cramming out with goodness. This isn't for weight loss. You know, it's this is for sustenance this is for vitality this is eating foods that and it's a way of blending flavors that optimize your your nutrition you know for those seven days so you don't crave you don't have room to crave like for the first time you, you know your body is getting that full 360 of what it needs from, from a nutrient point of view as well it's about nutrient density actually i'd say and it's then with the removal of sugar so that's why i've done that packed out so much for the seven day cleanse i just feel it feels a little bit kind of easier for some people over the 21 days which is for the more hardcore i think I love that. Such an amazing way to finish. And Leisha, where is the best place for people to pick up the book and where can they go to check out the 21 day program? So the 21 day program is on the website, which is www.makemesugarfree.com. And the book you can pre-order at the moment. Um, It's on sale on Amazon, on the book depository, Books A Million, and oh there's another one but i've forgotten so oh and barnes and noble there we go barnes and noble amazing and for everybody listening i will link the book in the show notes i will link the 21 day program and the website i will also link leisha's make me sugar free youtube channel and instagram highly recommend the instagram page for amazing recipes go check out the book go check out the website leisha i love this conversation love the content you're putting out there i've been dying to chat for ages so keep doing what you're doing and thank you so much for your time brian thank you so so much for giving me this opportunity and for your time and right back at you i absolutely adore your instagram page and the tiktoks brilliant thank you so much (laughs) my pleasure chat to you soon all right take care bye there you have it nutrition coach Leisha Kakain make me sugar free on sugar cleanses beating the addiction and making yourself sugar free absolutely love this podcast I've been dying to record this one since we set it up as I said at the top of the episode I've been following Leisha's Instagram page for ages and she puts up incredible content with recipes and nutritional and cooking ideas around going sugar free so go check out her book 7 day sugar cleanse and her website make me sugar free.com for her 21 day program as always if you enjoyed today's podcast podcast be sure to take a screenshot pop it up on your instagram stories and you can tag me brian underscore keen underscore fitness and you can tag alicia on make me sugar free on instagram that's all from this week's episode catch you all next monday